News from Pakistan is usually reported in the Western media when there's a terrorist outrage. One such outrage took place a few weeks ago when a group of four terrorists, according to the Pakistani investigation bureaus uh, sent from Afghanistan, went into a university built in honor of a great national leader in the northern province of Pakistan, attacked the university, killed some professors, killed a few students before the security forces came and shot them dead. This had happened exactly, almost exactly a year after. The same group, according to reports, had targeted a school where children of army officers in particular uh, were being educated and killed dozens of uh, young children and teachers. That did create a wave of horror in Pakistan. The terrorist leader at the time responded with the following words, now you know what it feels like when children die. Your children have died and you're upset. But when our children die after indiscriminate drone attacks, no one cares a damn. He was, of course, absolutely right. Uh, when middle, upper middle class kids are killed, the shock is felt deeply by the elite and the ruling layers in the country. When the poor die, and they have died in larger numbers over the last few years uh, because of the drone attacks, the numbers are noted. Usually it's a small paragraph in the Western media and the odd headline in Pakistan, but that too is very rare. It's not that what happens isn't outrageous, but the key questions are never asked in Pakistan or abroad. In Pakistan, they know the answers, but they're not prepared to discuss them. What I'm talking about is the everyday disasters that take place in the country the living conditions of the people, the lack of education, the fact that half the children born die of malnutrition. Of the rest, many are born stunted. The average height of the Pakistani citizen is now being reduced, is going down. There is no education for the vast majority of the population. What, what happens? A vacuum is created and many young people or their parents feel that religion is the only solution and that if this means sending children to religious schools controlled by people who act as transmission belts for terrorist organizations, so be it. They get nothing else and nothing else seems to uh, matter to the people in power, so why not do this? And it's the transmission belt that has to be understood, because without it, it's very difficult to understand what takes place. Why are so many young people prepared to sacrifice their lives, to become suicide bombers, to become complete, completely supine in the face of instructions from uh, jihadi leaders? I think it's because they see no other alternative in the country. And if the truth be told, Pakistan is largely run by an elite to defend its own interests and the interests of a middle, upper middle class layer in the cities. 
They have schools, they have hospitals, their lives are protected, their houses are guarded, they have electricity when no one else can uh, get access to it, etc., etc. Yes, it is a question of class in Pakistan and has been for a very long time. And these issues are never brought up because they are not fashionable anywhere in the world. No one wants to discuss them. But I've been convinced now for many decades that one of the big problems in Pakistan is the lack of free education, proper schooling. Where it takes place, it takes place with curriculums that are so backward, so outdated, that one honestly feels it were better if the kids weren't taught some of this rubbish at all. The figures you get in terms of infant mortality in Pakistan are amongst the worst in the world. This should not still be happening. And so you have a country where the mood amongst ordinary people is despairing and fatalistic. Despairing because no one cares for them. Fatalistic, they say it must be God's will. And when a preacher comes and tells them that it's God's will that you give one of your children, your sons, not the daughters, to be educated in our, in our religious schools, then the transmission belt begins to work. And of course, this transmission belt cannot be stopped suddenly because the governments, whether military or civilian, do not have the will to do so. It's not simply a question of going and killing terrorists or droning them or whatever, which liberals get very excited by. That has not managed to solve the issue. It's not the case that the Pakistani army has not been trying to stop this. They have. But what they do is they go, they carry out attacks, they kill people, they arrest people, and they come back. Or they move people away from the regions uh, they feel are dangerous and need to be protected, put them in camps, and then what? The whole process starts to take place again. And as Western governments know, when you have a mobile enemy, it is not easy to track the enemy down and destroy it. And it's not easy for the Pakistani army either. Add to this an additional problem. And that problem is the clashes with India. Now, a few months ago, the Indian Prime Minister decided to pay an informal call on his Pakistani counterpart in Lahore. The Pakistani Prime Minister received him, they had dinner together, they said they would work together. It's very obvious that this was an initiative taken by Washington to try and decrease and reduce Pakistan's dependence and friendly relations with China by telling the Indians that they had to act as the regional power and take up their responsibilities. The immediate response a few days later to this visit, was terrorists belonging to a group called jaish e Muhammad attacked an Indian Air Force base not far from the Pakistan border in Pathan Court, and for three days there were continuous firing and attacks. A number of Indian servicemen were killed, the terrorist phones were captured, and Indian intelligence said that these phones were linked to lines and numbers in, in Pakistan. Arrests have been made. The question arises, did jaish e Muhammad carry out this attack of their own accord? Or did they do it because some rogue element within the Pakistani military intelligence services had ordered them to do so? We do not know. There's no doubt that many of these groups were created by the Pakistani military intelligence, backed by the CIA, backed by the DIA, and Western intelligence organizations in the 80s to fight the Russians in Afghanistan. 
Have they become Frankensteins, as some argue, and are now totally out of the control of the military? Or does the military still have some sway over them? The fact is, Jashe Muhammad in particular had, till recently, headquarters and offices in a number of cities in Pakistan. Yet, uh, nobody did anything. There were no arrests, no trials, no charges. Now, since the attack in India, uh, there have been attempts to uh, try and grab the leadership because the Indians are insisting on it. So a lot is mixed up in what happens in Pakistan. It's an incredibly murky situation, and it is not enough to say that it's simply the ISI, because quite a lot of these groups that were formed have gone rogue. As we know from experiences elsewhere in the world, particularly the Middle East, that sometimes organizations that are created to fight one enemy, when that particular battle is over, do go rogue and turn their guns on those who first gave them those orders, as the United States is discovering in the Middle East. Uh, in Pakistan, it's not exactly the same, but it's similar because a lot of the attacks waged by the Pakistani Taliban, some have been against educational institutions, some have been against security installations and targeting military and naval headquarters in a number of cities in the country. So it is not clear. Is there a solution? Well, the solution lies not simply in peace and stability returning to Afghanistan, because this latest phase of terrorism is linked very directly to the NATO Western occupation of uh, Afghanistan, which carries on until and unless there is a stable government in Afghanistan and Western bases are closed down, I'm afraid this is likely to continue. But what about the second part? The second question, how to curb the transmission belts that encourage young people to go and join these groups? Here, there is no immediate solution. There is no short-term solution. Had the governments decided 20 years ago to create a proper education system for the country, to offer alternatives, to create a more meritocratic system, uh, things might have been better. But having failed to do that, they have effectively allowed the existence of a huge social layer, which is semi-literate, which believes in religiosity of one variety or the other, and which is quite sympathetic in a very broad sense to the jihadis, because they have no other way of thought, no other way of thinking, and successive governments have run away from doing that. A few months ago, in December last year, I was in Pakistan. I met an old friend I hadn't seen for over 40 years. We sat down, we talked as old friends do, picked up where we'd left off and began to talk about friends we'd had in common many years ago. Many had died. And then I asked about a particular person who I had liked when we were at university together. And he said, oh, you know, he's having a nervous breakdown, I think. He's very depressed. It's a deep depression. What happened, I asked. He said, do you really want the story? I said, yes. He said, you know, he became a very senior civil servant, commissioner of Lahore, big civil service jobs, fated everywhere. And then as happens in the civil service, you retire. And when he retired, he had this huge depression. I said, withdrawal symptoms from not exercising power. He said, you would have thought so, but it wasn't that. When I went to speak to him, he said I made a huge mistake. All my time as a civil servant, I didn't take a single bribe. And when I see kids who are junior to me, many, many years junior to me, now 
absolutely drowning in money and spending money as if there was no tomorrow, I begin to ask myself, why wasn't I corrupt as well? And that, my friend explained, was the reason for the depression. Now, I tell this story because I'm sure it's one of many, but to highlight the fact that the corruption that exists in Pakistan, and not just in Pakistan, India is no better, and nor are many Western countries, so there's not a Pakistani problem alone, but here you feel it more because the level of poverty for 70 to 80% of the population is so huge that every instance of corruption appears criminal in the worst sense of the word. And this corruption is from the top downwards. And this is the corruption that makes the elite and criminals of various sorts who have risen to the top, the scum that comes to the top of the water, completely fearless in terms of accumulating money. And the money and wealth accumulated is spent on either fancy projects, which mean little to most of the people, or distributed within the gangs and the families. And politics thus becomes effectively a way of making money. You have to be in power because this is how you make money. And generals have done it just as much as civilian politicians. So the notion that the army is pure uh, is complete nonsense. And that's one reason why it hasn't been possible to go for corruption in a big way because it affects the armed forces and armed services in the country. And it brings to mind a story which a friend loves telling me and repeating it to me, which dates back to the 16th century. And it's an interesting story, uh, but it shows that some things don't change. A man in the 16th century, according to this mythology and joke, was not satisfied with the decision taken by a junior magistrate in relation to a case that was being heard against him. So he turned, he ignored the magistrate and appealed to a senior judge, the Qadi. That is what the magistrate advised him. The man replied, but he's your brother. He won't listen to me. The magistrate said, Go to the Mufti, the expert in Muslim law. The man replied, but he's your uncle. The magistrate said, go to the minister. The man replied, he's your grandfather. The magistrate said, go to the king. The man replied, your niece is engaged to him. The magistrate, livid with anger at this defiance, said, go to hell then. The man replied, that's where your esteemed father reigns. He'll see to it I get no satisfaction there. And that 16th century storyteller is actually talking about events that are going on in, in Pakistan today. It's not just the malnutrition, which is deeply disturbing and shocking, the lack of education, it's the lack of health care. It's the fact that thousands, literally thousands of young girls, mainly from poor families, who have no power nor the means to complain, are lifted off the streets, kidnapped. Their parents can never recover them, or rarely, because they do not have the means to do so. The figures for 2015 are that 2,160 girls went missing. Seven murdered children were reported uh, uh, in one city alone. Nothing is done, and these are figures which we know because they have been reported. 
There are many things that are not reported um, uh, in this country because the poor feel what's the point of, uh, of reporting them. There are between 9 and 11 million child laborers below the ages of 14 who work like in the worst Victorian conditions reported in the 19th century in this country. So these are the problems which no one ever talks about. And in my opinion, talking simply about security and terror, serious though these problems are, is going to make absolutely no difference to Pakistan unless the real problems are tackled. Now, we live in a world where to tackle these problems is not to simply run up against your own elites. It is to run up against global elites and their institutions. Like if you're getting money, loans from the International Monetary Fund, etc., you're not allowed to do certain things. Restrictions are placed on this. And state expenditure on health and education is seriously discouraged because these are things that are to be done privately. Well, they cannot be done privately in large parts of the world and they have never been done privately in Pakistan. Occasionally, you have volunteer organizations which try and help, but effectively, that's simply a drop in a river or an ocean doesn't work at all. So the politicians in Pakistan are utterly useless. And this cycle, the political cycle of Pakistan is fairly straightforward. One party comes to power, makes a lot of money, voted out of power. Another party comes to power, makes a lot of money, nothing changes, corruption increases, etc then people begin to feel perhaps the army will sort everything out. And suddenly posters appear in the streets of the city, we want the general to take over. In this case, the general is Raheel Sharif, the chief of staff of the Pakistan army. According to every opinion poll in the country, the most popular man, and people have been waiting for him to take over. The last week of January, General Sharif announced that he is not going to stay on as Chief of Staff. He will retire when his term is over and another general will take over. So there's a lot of disappointment being reported in the Pakistani media who were hoping that he would take over. And what General Sharif is like personally, I have no idea. I've not met him don't know what he's like, perhaps he's a very honest man, but the problem is not individuals, the problem is institutions. And it's not as if the army hasn't tried to run the country before. In my opinion, the army didn't want to take power again because nothing happens in the country without their permission being sought. So they exercise power and it's the politicians who get the blame. Whenever good things happen, the army can take credit, like uh, improving the law and order situation temporarily in Karachi, they take the credit. When bad things happen, they blame the politicians. So the notion that the army is going to reform the country or transform the country is not something that one can take too seriously. Pakistan faces huge problems and these problems are not simply linked to the NATO occupation of Afghanistan. The acts of terrorism are and were, it was predictable and I did predict that this is what would happen in the border regions. But there are many things going on inside Pakistan that it can't simply be blamed on the West. The local elites have to take some responsibility. And the conditions that I have described are conditions which have existed now for 30, 40 years. We can go even further back to when the country was first founded in 1947. 
it is one of the most venal elites in the region and does very little for its people. Basically, it doesn't care. It doesn't have a sense of responsibility. So what are the people going to do? The poets, the writers, the activists, the intellectuals try to fight back, but increasingly with uh, little effect. A very well-known Punjabi poet, Fakhar Zaman, recently or some decades ago, tried to warn people against despairing by telling them that when the time comes, the people will rise. But it's not that the people haven't risen. They have. There was an insurrection. There was struggles for democracy. There were attempts to reintroduce democracy. People were killed. So the, it's not the people of Pakistan who are to blame. It's those who have come to power, often on the backs of a popular uprising, and have failed to deliver. The two main parties in Pakistan, the People's Party of Benazir Bhutto is now virtually dead in most of the country, except her native province of Sindh. The Sharif brothers control the ruling party, whose big base is in the largest province in the country, the Punjab. And even as I speak, news arrives from Pakistan that following the security uh, situation uh, and what happened when the university was blown up, all schools in the Punjab have been closed down for a week. The argument is that the weather is too cold for children to be properly taught, but the weather actually is quite mild in the week they were closed down. They are not prepared to say that this is because they have received threats that more schools are going to be attacked. And the people who attack these schools, the jihadi groups, fear any education which isn't under their control. So what is to be done? Uh, the only thing that can be done is to fight and fight and fight again till this elite is removed, uh, till some honest politicians arise. And the Punjabi poet, Fakhar Zaman, who a couple of decades ago wrote uh, about the people, uh, is correct. But the problem is that how long can people carry on fighting and still carry on suffering? That is the nature of the world we live in. And it seems worse in some countries than in others because it is worse. And Pakistan is one of these countries. This is what the poet Fakhar Saman wrote. How can he who lost his eyesight paint? How can he who lost his hands sculpt? How can he who lost his hearing compose music? How can he whose tongue was cut out sing? How can he whose hands are tied write poetry? And how can he whose feet are fettered dance? With muffled nose and mouth, how can one inhale the scent of flowers? But all this has really happened. Without eyes we painted, without hands we sculpted statues, without hearing we composed music, deprived of a tongue we sang. Hands cuffed we wrote poetry, with fettered legs we danced, and the fragrance of flowers pierced our muffled mouths and nostrils. The one thing Pakistan has never been short on is poets. <laughs>